Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, session series of series of uh, uh, sessions over the internet in this uh, entitled Reimagining the Security Sector in Sudan. Uh, my name is Dr. Luca Bionel Cole, and I am the Dean of the of Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And I supervise the program regarding the development of uh, national security strategy in Africa. And I will be the first moderator of this session this morning. Before we kick off this session, I would like to say simple, uh, a few words. I would like to uh, provide, the, give the floor to Dr. Knopf uh, from the uh, Africa Center of Strategic Studies. Uh, she will start. She is the uh, the director of this of the program of of Africa uh, Center of Strategic Studies, and uh, uh, so I would like to give her the floor. This program uh, and this session is uh, a co cooperation between uh, the Africa Center of Strategic Studies and United States Institute of Peace. Together, they have come together to uh, organize this program. I would like to say that. Ms. Kate, Susan, is one of the dearest uh, friends to Sudan. I, we would like to give her to the opportunity to kick off the session and to say a few words, uh, Ms. Knopf, and then Susan will also have the opportunity to talk and start this. Uh, Kate, Ms. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Luca, and it is a great pleasure, along with the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, to welcome uh, all of the, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies alumni, distinguished colleagues, and friends. Thank you for joining us for this program today. Uh, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies it serves as a forum for research, for academic programs, and for the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a U.S. Department of Defense academic center located at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. We do not, however, speak for the Defense Department or the U.S. government. We are an academic institution. We carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, by providing a trusted platform for dialogue, by building enduring relationships, and by catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. Recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. By engaging with our African partners, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, as well as national and regional, we hope to reinforce that all have uh, valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. This kind of dialogue infused with real world uh, experiences and fresh analysis such as we're going to hear today, we hope it provides uh, an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. Uh, so we're really glad to, to be joined uh, together uh, with the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, to have uh, some uh, uh, very expert uh, speakers uh, to bring us cases uh, today of relevance for reimagining uh, the security sector in Sudan. Uh, and we're delighted to, to be part of this conversation uh, with everyone who's joined us uh, uh, on the webinar today. And we look forward to, uh, to more participation with you in the future. Susan, over to you. Thanks, Kate. Let me add uh, my welcome from the US Institute of Peace uh, to this seminar and, and thanks to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and your faculty and colleagues for their partnership in this initiative. USIP is an independent, nonpartisan institute that was established by the United States Congress over 30 years ago. USIP is dedicated to the prospect that peace is possible. We advance this mission by partnering with um, civil society organizations and governments around the world to share skills, experiences, and networks 
on dialogue, mediation, nonviolence, security sector reform, and other areas critical to peace. We also work to inform US policies, um, to work closely with the US government, with multilateral institutions, and in the partner countries where we work. In many ways, I don't think there is any other place in the globe where USIP's mandate is more important or urgent than in the Horn of Africa. We see the tremendous hope um, with the transition in Sudan. We hear from our colleagues their high expectations, and we see the hard work that is going into that transition. We know that transitions are also difficult. They pose dilemmas. There's a need to bridge between citizens and governments and expectations that security will look much better in communities and across the country. So for that reason, we're so pleased to partner with you today and to hear from our colleagues about their experiences in security sector reform. Dr. Luca, back over to you. Thank you very much, Susan, for your uh, great introduction, for your kind words. Um, I would like also to welcome you here. I would like to say that either, even if we won't be able to see each other during the session, uh, I would like to say that, uh, of course, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. You you are uh, representing uh, a great entity and uh, we are very happy to benefit from your experience and uh, to exchange our experiences during uh, the, this session. As you all said, um, uh, one of the main missions of the of the Institute is to realize the human security in, in, uh, in Africa and to in promote the sector of security through, uh, through uh, establishing, uh, uh, establishing bridges between uh, African uh, countries. This session is one of the crucial sessions that can contribute to that. And I think it's a great way whereby we could uh, realize our objectives and we could work together uh, Sudan is uh, of course faces several issues, several problems, and these problems need uh, a national uh, trustworthy dialogue uh, and a candid dialogue, a dialogue whereby uh, we, uh, that could be heard by everybody and a dialogue uh, that could represent all the voices because uh, there is no, uh, because there is no specific sector that could provide uh, specific solutions. Uh, so the objective of this uh, session is to enable Sudan, especially during the, this critical period, uh, to, uh, to, to transcend uh, ma major existing challenges. In Africa Center, as uh, Kate uh, said very clearly, um, we noticed that, that that to provide security for the African citizen is a great challenge. And in some cases, we have noticed that the countries themselves, uh, because of a lack of stability and a lack of security uh, that could be provided to uh, the citizen, uh, faces major challenges. And we have noticed as well that uh, despite uh, of course, the spendings and the funds that have been raised in the, in the security sector and the funds that were allocated, they, we don't see really uh, improvements in the security sector. Uh, and uh, furthermore, we see that this is also existing in other countries. This uh, failure to provide uh, security for the uh, African citizen could be the main reason behind uh, the failure of governance and the lack of leadership in the uh, in 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 the country, uh, and and the main failure in a failure in addressing some of the major challenges. Sudan, like every other uh, African country, faces uh, several issues and say several challenges. We are also proved that through various studies that the development of a of a national security strategy. Uh, re calls for the participation, the participation and the cooperation of all the sectors, uh, the decision makers in African countries uh, could uh, face uh, security challenges, and but sometimes they failed in providing security 
to the African citizen. The main uh, objective behind all those sessions or seminars is to try to look at Sudan and uh, from another perspective and how we could uh, realize or implement a national security strategy. Any uh, external intervention cannot determine what's going to happen and what the situation is. I think we all we have to do is to support the efforts that have been invested so far and to work towards uh, transcending the existing challenges. So in this seminar, we will have a series of uh, seminars and these seminars uh, will be very well structured. We will we will talk about the transitional de 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 democratic transitions and the role of, of course, uh, the uh, security uh, sector, reimagining the security sector in Sudan. And uh, we will also tackle uh, some of the topics, especially uh, regarding the civilian military relations and what we could do uh, in order to reinforce and promote the connections and the, rela the relations between the civilians and the military. Uh, the, se the, the other seminar will be uh, held in April, uh, April 2nd at two o'clock and it will be uh, Khartoum time and we will focus on the on the national security strategy as a tool to improve the relations between the civilians and the military and also to to realize uh, the, uh, the this of course the security sector and and see what the security sector plays as a role during especially the transitional period uh, the last seminar will uh, focus as well at the role of the the importance of the national security strategy in Sudan, especially in the in the present period, and and it will be from the Sudanese uh, perspectives, especially those who attended uh, the, the the previous seminars. These sessions will be will be uh, like a dialogue between uh, with with some experts, uh, especially in the in the per pertinent. Uh, topics, so it, they, they will last 45 minutes, and uh, then it will be followed by a question answer session, and uh, uh, the dialogue uh, will be recorded, but the question answer session will not be recorded uh, in order, and this is how the sessions will be administered. Specifically, uh, the the objectives behind the session today are are four. First, uh, we will we, first we will determine what these objectives are. First, what are the lessons learned uh, regarding the security sector, especially during the transitional periods in the African continent per se? Uh, we will provide examples uh, from. Uh, Tunisia, and we will hear about you know the experience in Tunisia and uh, t Tunisia, and also the, the Sudanese experience. The second objective will be as follows: to uh, look for lessons learned, uh, especially regarding the, uh, the the reform the, the reforms that have been uh, made in the security sector, and and see how this is in the transitional how this takes place in the transitional uh, period. Uh, number three. Um, discuss what Sudan could learn from these uh, African experiences in order uh, to uh, better manage the transitional period. Uh, at last, uh, we will endeavor to um, uh, uh, share some tools in order to develop the uh, national security strategy in Africa. Uh, these are the the, the, subject, the objectives that we will try to, uh, of course, uh, determine today. I hope we will be successful in doing that. Before, uh, before uh, kicking off this session, I will talk about the the experts that are present before us, the panelists. So, um, as I said, the session or the seminar will be like a, in a shape of a dialogue with the, with our experts we will present questions and and we will provide them with the opportunity to answer these very questions uh, in the dialogue session 
uh, if you'd like, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to ask a que question, uh, uh, you could start uh, writing those questions and sending them through the chat. Uh, and uh, you could very well uh, start during the dialogue or following the dialogue. And if you'd like to uh, ask a question during the, you could uh, you could raise your hand uh, in the uh, in the in the chat uh, function. We will uh, re receive the questions in Arabic and in in English. If you'd like any uh, technical assistance. Uh, the staff of uh, uh, USIP and ACSS will be at your disposal to uh, answer those uh, questions. Um, I would like to uh, present uh, the, the, the objective of this session. Okay, so there are three objectives during this uh, tra transition period and uh, these uh, reimagining the sector, the security sector. So first, we would like to, uh, to look at the important role that is played by the security uh, sector during the, tr the transitional period. Uh, we have uh, to look at also the lessons learned uh, during this uh, transitional period. Uh, and uh, look at these uh, lessons learned. And the third role objective is to discuss the reasons uh, behind the failure of some uh, democratic regimes and uh, uh, see how we can uh, remedy that and, and look at the uh, civilian military relations. So these are the three uh, objectives that we will look at today. Uh, we have among us, uh, some uh, some info that we provided in the, in our website and uh, uh, they are like a, in the shape of articles and uh, that you could benefit from uh, you could ladies and gentlemen uh, look at these articles and this uh, info in order to benefit from uh, the dialogue and from the uh, upcoming uh, sessions uh, allow me ladies and gentlemen to present uh, the uh, speakers i am very pleased to introduce two distinguished uh, experts, uh, distinguished uh, speakers. They are uh, experts in the transitional uh, period. I am very pleased and I'm very thankful and grateful for their, for their participation, uh, given their experience and their expertise in this uh, field. Uh, we have provided the biographies, but we would like to focus on the major points of these uh, biographies and their uh, skills. So let's start with Dr. Adnan Mansur. He served as a spokesperson to Tunisian President uh, Monsif Marzouki uh, from, uh, uh, for, for two years, from 2012 to 2014. It was a, a, a critical period in, in Tunisia's democratic transition. Uh, furthermore, he served as the di di director of uh, uh, presidential campaign. Uh, he is um, he's a professor of modern history at the university in uh, Sousse, uh, and he specialized in uh, the history of institutions and political thought. Uh, furthermore, he served as a university's vice dean, and he was also a researcher at the Inst uh, Institute uh, 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 the Higher Institute of History of the Movement of the National Movement and a member of the Higher Political Reform Commission. Uh, he is the founder and director of the Center of Strategic Studies on the Maghrib. He holds um, a PhD doctoral degree in history from the university in Sousse. He was also Dr. Adnan. Uh, I would like to tell you that he he attended a dialogue in Khurkum in uh, March of uh, 2020. And he was one of the speakers during this dialogue. Uh, and uh, he, uh, of course, spoke about the Tunisian experience. The second speaker is uh, uh, Professor Ahmed uh, E. Ahmed. He's a he's a professor uh, in in the uh, Department of Political Science. Uh, it's uh, 
it's it, at the University of Khartoum. Uh, he was the, man, the director of uh, the Higher Academy for Strategic uh, Security Studies. Uh, he occupied the position of a dean at the Faculty of Economic and Social Sciences at the University of Khartoum. He received his doctoral degree from the University of North Texas, and he received his master's degree from the University of Missouri in Columbia. Uh, he occupied the position of a visiting professor in Ahmed B. Muhammad Military College, Qatar, and the Graduate School of International Area Studies, Hankook University, South Korea. Uh, so uh, he uh, received, uh, of course, uh, his recent publications include Military Neo-Professionalism and Arab Rising, uh, uh, Professor Hassan is also uh, is also a, a an expert in the uh, session, and he also attended the, the March dialogue of last year. I would like to just start with uh, Mr. Adnan, uh, Dr. Adnan Mansar. Uh, so I would like to talk that to say that the Tunisian experience has its own uh, particularity. Uh, we would we would love to learn from this experience because it 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 is enriching and uh, because it, it, it tackled some challenges to Tunisia today is, is a perfect example of this transitional period. And especially after the revolution it went through and the challenges it faced. Uh, Dr. Adnan Mansur, we would like to express our fullest thanks uh, uh, for your presence. Thank you very much for attending. We are very pleased uh, to welcome you. I am sure that Sudanese people will benefit from your experience and from your uh, speed. Uh, I would like first to start with a question. Uh, based on your personal experience and your participation in this uh, transitional period in Tunisia, why, Dr. Hadnan Mansar, do you think that uh, security sector and, uh, for example, the, uh, the intelligence uh, apparatus is one of the main mechanisms during the transitional periods in in, in Tunisia. The, the the floor is yours, Dr. Adnan Mansur. Thank you very much, Dr. Luca, for this uh, for this invitation, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, to to talk about the, the Tunisian experience with my brothers in Sudan and my brothers in the Uni United States Institute of Peace and, and my brothers in an ACSS. Uh, I would like uh, especially, uh, I would like to talk about the, the, the session that was uh, for a year ago. Uh, I'm very pleased to come here again and to share my experience. In order uh, to cut the matter short, I would like to answer, to go straight to the point and answer the question that was posed by Dr. Luca, especially the question uh, pertaining to the importance and the critical position of, uh, of uh, intelligence, the role of uh, intelligence and the security sector in the transitional period. Uh, what, the, what is the role that is played in the failure or the success during this uh, transitional period? I would like to give you a few signs uh, in order for those who listen to me to be able to understand and to determine, to, to determine the, the Tunisian uh, model in this. So uh, Tunisia, uh, the, major, the ma uh, majority of citizens live in the in the, in the cities, the literacy uh, level is high. Uh, I think uh, you know that uh, in Tunisia, we have like a lot of uh, tribal tribes and, uh, and we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, things going on. And in Tunisia, we should not forget that it is very important that Tunisia was one of the uh, leaders to set up a first uh, constitution. Uh, the first constitution in um, uh, 1860, uh, even uh, the, uh, the the political movement during the uh, French colonialism uh, demanded this uh, the setting up of this constitution and played a great role in uh, setting up the uh, forces in, uh, in in Tunisia. So during the 30 years before the revolution, uh, especially uh, during the reign of our of uh, of Zindin Bel Abidin. And uh, during the 10 last years of the previous president, uh, Al-Habib Bourguiba, uh, the, the regime was transformed, uh, especially 
and uh, we have had the emergence of a new uh, a new we have had the emergence of new intellectuals a new generation of intellectuals and new people who have uh, expressed uh, themselves in a different way so the regime has become a little bit narrow minded and uh, we have had uh, uh, have the emergence of a few issues at the, uh, especially at a few sectors, and the regime has become uh, what was called and was described like a political regime uh, par excellence, especially during the latest years of the reign of Bin Abidin, the presidency of Bin Abidin. So I would like to point out to the very important point here that uh, there were major demonstrations and protests uh, during the last years, and it was uh, uh, it was like the demonstrations during the 14th of January, January, and it was uh, performed before the Ministry of the Interior, and it was uh, one of the de demonstrations that demonstrations that completely changed the course of events, and it created it brought to light new transformations, and this is what we call the transitional period. Why the Ministry of Interior? Because because there was conviction that the regime in, in Tunisia was like uh, propelled by the Ministry of Interior. It's true that there were civilians that were leading the country, but uh, the main apparatus, uh, apparatus that was uh, uh, prevailing uh, was uh, mainly uh, uh, during, especially the crisis was one propelled by the Ministry of Interior. This very fact uh, uh, left this uh, apparatus uh, inc it it was uh, able for that apparatus to include all the uh, intelligence. Uh, the proof is that the Ministry of, Inf of Interior was the one that was uh, providing the permits for demonstrations and protests. It provided the, uh, of course, the uh, permits to associations. And so there was a kind of uh, prevalence of the, of, of the intelligence uh, apparatus or mechanism and that it was uh, so this apparatus or this mechanism was uh, supervising and monitoring all the other sectors so no one was imagining that it was possible uh, to make the transitional period successful without the uh, the uh, the the cooperation with civilians and i think that uh, the fact of uh, removing the civilians from the regime was a, a, an impossible fact uh, because there was there were, there were always threats of upheavals and turmoils in the country so uh, i do believe that there was However, that was uh, within uh, a legal context, uh, whether they were political or civilian people. Uh, everybody was aware uh, of the uh, bad things that were happening in the um, uh, the Ministry of uh, Interior, especially when it comes to the um, speech and freedom of speech. Then. Uh, things became after that uh, stable um, and and the leadership should have to go to the some uh, administrative whether uh, to civilians or to judgment uh, judges uh, uh, so that to ensure uh, the uh, rule of law after that uh, the uh, preparation became to be better and the new appointments became better. Uh, gradually, uh, they started uh, to get rid of old employees, uh, either through uh, retirement uh, or uh, a pension or through compensation and uh, dispute them over other institutions of uh, the uh, country. And this uh, make it, uh, the coexistence between all of them better. And we noticed that uh, the uh, fractions be became less. Um, and uh, the Ministry of Interior, uh, when faced by these infractions or any uh, um, demonstrations by the people, they have to deal with that uh, in comparison to previous times. The other thing, the Ministry of Interior became uh, and considered itself as a participant of this uh, uh, democratic transition. And uh, this partnership, and without the, uh, the degree of uh, any 
whether it, we're talking about uh, the uh, security people or the, the police became uh, under pressure of the new laws. And uh, one of these uh, most important laws is uh, the accessibility to information. And the Ministry of Inf uh, Interior became uh, obligated to uh, uh, provide uh, information, especially if it is not uh, un uh, illegal. Uh, and also to monitor the uh, deputies uh, in the parliament or the parliamentarian. So there was uh, some sort of uh, continuous push uh, in this uh, ministry to ensure that uh, the people working there uh, uh, abide by the rules. The other thing, uh, uh, also the recognition of our t uh, telephones uh, become illegal without a ju judicial warrant. And uh, the other thing that became illegal is uh, having uh, detained uh, someone without the presence of a lawyer. And of course that reflected uh, on the some employees uh, working on um, or at the Ministry of Interior. Uh, uh, we are only talking here about the Ministry of Interior, security and uh, intelligence and civil intelligence. We're not talking uh, uh, about the uh, armed forces. That mean the pressure on the uh, security uh, forces, um, uh, they are pressured to, to abide by the law. And uh, the last thing that happened in February, uh, our, uh, January 14th, uh, the Minister of Interior tried to uh, prevent the demonstrators uh, to, uh, to assemble in the place that they were supposed to assemble at. And the, the scene was a bit weird because there were some uh, violations uh, committed by the demonstrators against uh, the uh, security, but the, um, uh, the instructions were uh, to, to the police that they're not supposed to uh, respond to these uh, violations. Uh, what that, uh, that means that uh, we are in the democratic transition. Uh, well, it seems like the Ministry of Interior that um, grew its mind, so to speak, and they knew how to deal now with uh, such uh, violations and uh, to, to deal with it. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Adnan, for uh, your uh, narration and the great role for the democratic transition uh, in the ex uh, Tunisian uh, uh, in Tunisian experience. The second question, and uh, based on the student, uh, Tunisian experience, what are the reasons uh, that leads uh, the security to get away from the authority? How they make sure that the democratic transition is uh, good uh, for the security um, um, sector. I can uh, answer in two uh, complete ways or answers. Uh, I think if we uh, reassure the security people that can happen only through clear laws uh, that lead that the person uh, who or the person who commit a crime uh, should be dealt with under the law. The second thing that make the security personnel uh, be part of uh, this uh, dem a democratic transition and find roles uh, or alternative and supportive roles uh, for the uh, 
security institution. For example, uh, uh, anti-terrorism, and anti-terrorism is weird and new to the uh, society in Tunis. Uh, holding or carrying weapon uh, is illegal in uh, Tunis since the 1950s. So uh, the authorities have the authority uh, to uh, go after people who have uh, weapons, uh, and they are the only ones who have the authority to carry weapons. So it is the role and uh, the work of the uh, security institute. Uh, and it became its main role to fight terrorism and the terrorist group, uh, they are very small. Um, they're about 10 uh, person most. Uh, and this war against terrorism uh, created some sympathy between uh, civilian and security. And a few years back, there was uh, some attack in the south, uh, uh, who uh, Daesh or ISIS um, attacked that area and security and civilians uh, try to confront with the uh, terrorists. So it seems that we have a new uh, way or form to transform fair or transform uh, the security uh, function uh, uh, from just uh, watching and monitoring uh, people and organizations and societies into protecting the uh, democratic regime through uh, confronting and uh, fighting terrorism. The other point, and is very important, it is uh, the um, um, financial violations. Since uh, a decade ago, uh, the Constitution uh, have uh, some uh, financial structures within uh, the national uh, institution to um, fight corruption. And any official who uh, found uh, guilty in corruption, uh, he has to give up all his uh, properties under the law, and he cannot uh, start uh, 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 and uh, commence with his work until he um, declare all his properties before he starts. Uh, and also he has to declare before he leaves. So, uh, so uh, there will be a comparison to see if uh, his uh, properties and um, has enlarged and grew. Uh, so, we, this came out because there was some contradiction um, and conflict of interest uh, before. So this, uh, this was good because um, we have to monitor the authority, whether this is uh, related to uh, a security personnel or not. And the previous um, a regime uh, was um, based on uh, exchanging benefits and uh, its nepotism. So uh, one of the main things uh, we discovered that we have uh, uh, to, uh, to, to take care of this security issue before it was like, if you want to commit a crime, uh, we have to make the security good. So it was an, an ex exchange of some benefit. All of that did not encourage uh, the uh, security personnel uh, to uh, do it because they used to gain benefit from, but now the law forces them uh, to um, to give the information and any individual or any citizen to, uh, has to the right to access this uh, information. And uh, since we have civil society that's active and uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, I think all these factors are are components of a system uh, that is likely to help 
uh, the country and the state to have um, a security body uh, that is uh, good and involved uh, in the democratic transition. Thank you so much, Dr. Adnan. Uh, the last question with regards to the democratic transition in Tunisia, what are some of the lessons uh, learned that you can share uh, with uh, the uh, Sudanese uh, in order to transform the security sector uh, in order to be more uh, uh, civilian uh, led? Uh, during the democratic transition? Uh, it's a very important question, Luca. Um, I will give you an example. And this example, I think, uh, can provide the lessons. In the past, the uh, security institution just uh, used to um, um, uh, do what it's ordered to do. And uh, it also used to adapt by the, some political ideas. For example, before the revolution, the Ministry of Interior is the one, uh, uh, is the, the uh, body uh, responsible for uh, monitoring the elections. That means it can forge the um, or manipulate the elections. And after the revolution, now we have an independent uh, commission. Um, but the people who work in this commission, uh, they are uh, elected and can be uh, dismissed by any um, uh, authority. As, so uh, they have a certain in term to work with, uh, uh, to be independent with, but otherwise they can be dismissed. Um, the uh, the security apparently uh, uh, switch from being a designer uh, to the election uh, process and uh, violating sometimes uh, the and forging the election process to uh, institutions uh, uh, can that just. Uh, move from one place to another uh, for the election during the election uh, and to monitor the elections uh, without having any role in the formulation of election process uh, starting from the uh, announcement of the election uh, to the results of the election and i think this is very important and i think the the government and having money, um, um, multiple uh, governments uh, during the parliamentarian um, uh, parliaments. So I think most of these security uh, personnel uh, and leadership that they found out that it's very important to uh, respect uh, the the parliament or the uh, politi politicians regarding who he is. And um, we never had any revenge uh, after the revolution, um, even for those who were uh, involved in the torture uh, before the revolution or during the revolution. And uh, for there's some opposition. Uh, there was an opposition. Um, person uh, who stayed in the prisons uh, during uh, Bin Ali uh, for 16 years. And that started 2011. Uh, after the revolution, he became uh, the ministry, uh, minister of um, interior. And of course, that uh, happened uh, during a certain political context. Uh, uh, we don't have to, to mention right now. Um, and this meant that there should be a respect uh, for the law during uh, performing the, those tasks. So we have to go back to, uh, to focus on uh, the second part of this comment uh, that is uh, 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 
the security uh, doesn't have conviction or will not have the conviction uh, directly or immediately. It has to be gradual uh, through raising awareness, uh, through uh, developing and expanding the liberties uh, and also to take away some of the uh, em employments or uh, functions that uh, tend to take these liberties away and also through uh, uh, governments and electing governments. And this uh, little by little uh, deepen the uh, conviction for the security that the only protector for them is the law and and the democratic transition should be uh, dealt with through the logic of and uh, the overall uh, shelter of uh, in institutions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adnan, for your intervention uh, and your participation of the uh, Tunisian uh, exper experiment that is special. Uh, and also the uh, Sudanese one has its own experience, but we have to uh, learn uh, from uh, the uh, Tunisian uh, experience. Uh, for all the audience or participants, if you have any question uh, to Dr. Adnan, you can write those questions uh, in in the uh, chat and Zoom. And if maybe you can have also a direct in, uh, intervention or comment. Dr. Adnan, thank you so much. Let's uh, move now to the next uh, uh, speaker who is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hassan Haj Ali. Professor uh, Hassan Haj Ali, uh, he wrote uh, interesting articles. And maybe it's uh, uh, that article was one of the reasons he's with us today. Uh, and it was published in the uh, uh, Arabic uh, politics. Uh, and it was published in two. Uh, 2017, and uh, it was a, a special uh, publication, uh, and I think it was very uh, unique and special. Uh, this uh, article was written before the revolution, the, uh, the Sudanese revelation, and it uh, has a deep diagnosis of the democratic transition that happened in, the, in Sudan. Uh, uh, let's uh, move uh, to uh, Professor Hassan. Uh, according to the in your interesting article in the uh, uh, Arabic Siasa or Arabic politics, I would like you to share with the audience uh, what are the factors that uh, encourage the recurrent um, uh, military intervention in Sudan. Why, why is there a challenge by the military to uh, uh, to give uh, the authority to the civilians? First, I would like to thank Dr. Luca and to the organizers of this session, the African uh, Center for Strategic Studies and the US uh, International uh, uh, Institute of Peace. And to answer this important question, I think and I see that there is a, a, a group of reasons uh, that I would like to uh, brief as follow. The first. It has something to do with a politicization uh, over uh, or uh, overall politicization of uh, the Sudanese uh, witness, especially the military institution. Uh, a lot broad uh, uh, groups of people, uh, whether students um, or scholars, cler clerics, uh, religious clerics, um, workers, uh, were were politicized. Uh, 
it has started uh, as of the beginning of this uh, Islamic uh, revolution. Uh, some of them, they were working uh, in the Egyptian military. And, and, and that reflected in 1924, a revolution of 1924. Uh, uh, then uh, this institution started at uh, 1925, uh, and the first uh, strike happened in uh, uh, Sudan, happened in 1985, I'm saying 58, and it came, uh, there was an order uh, came from the uh, prime minister, uh, and the leader of this coup happened 1964, uh, toppled with the military um, uh, regime. And uh, during the investigation, uh, they figured out that uh, the reason uh, uh, of the, this coup happened that the, pri the prime minister uh, was part of the Al Umma party or the nation part party and he was afraid that the new parliamentarian uh, course or uh, will have a coalition a, a government uh, from uh, different parties and so he wanted to proceed uh, this uh, and started the coup the second coup happened may it happened may 1969 uh it held by uh, some um leftist uh, groups and uh the free um uh, uh officers of free army military uh, uh officers uh and the the leftist uh start to show um, uh, and their opinions are, are, are those who started to show ideologies started to show then in 1989 uh, the organization started this coup and it started in 30 years that means the military coups to, uh, used many times as a political uh, tool to uh, achieve uh, political objectives. Uh, they would not uh, achieve it otherwise through elections. The second uh, reason that the performance of the civil um, governments so these governments have uh, lots of divides. And the first democratic uh, uh, rule in uh, 19 uh, in the 1950s, uh, the the longest uh, period, uh, it was like uh, very short for years. Uh, the second. Uh, started uh, from 1965 until 1969. Uh, uh, so within that period, there was only four governments uh, and with all the different allies and coalitions formed. And this gave the information that the uh, uh, impression that the uh, civil governments are not stable and they keep changing their tactic uh, allies um, and alliances. The third reason, in my opinion, is the development uh, of the uh, role uh, of the military and its politics, whether Sudanese or Egyptian, because they wanted to uh, intervene directly um, uh, and be part of the uh, uh, politics. Uh, and uh, there, there was a transformation happened uh, in the third uh, coup uh, when the government has the uh, right of veto to form governments, uh, the gover uh, civil governments, 
and this reflects the memorandum of the military uh, that was um, uh, uh, put together in 1980, uh, demanding the government to um, do some reforms and certain um, policies. And of course, that led to uh, to demand the, the government uh, with certain things. And the leadership uh, came up with different uh, with a new communique uh, in March uh, of that same year, uh, asking the government uh, what they have done uh, with uh, a military communique or the uh, memorandum, and that uh, led to the change of the uh, coalition uh, government and the formulation of new co coalition um, government. Also, the military was, or the armed form forces, uh, uh, were the main uh, reason uh, to get to the uh, authority. Uh, all these enforces uh, the uh, the role of the economic development. Uh, we witnessed that uh, the uh, the. Uh, the military rule uh, as of its uh, formation and played the role uh, in the economic and it grew since then until now. Uh, the armed for uh, forces uh, started to have uh, uh, corporations and became uh, a force in the field. Uh, in brief, these are the reasons that I see that pushed the government or the, the military to be in. Thank you very much, Professor Hassan, for your uh, insightful uh, presentation and for determining the reasons. Uh, and thank you. And now we are going to move to the second question. You have said in your article very clearly that all the military interventions in the poli in the politics of Sudan uh, was either uh, through uh, an assistance or uh, or uh, or through concocting plans from the uh, the civilian sphere. So, what are the reasons that uh, uh, prompted Sudan uh, to to provide or to go into political sphere or instead of a uh, uh, especially during uh, during the elections in Sudan there are there is a number of reasons that uh, prompted the civilians to uh, to provide to uh, call for the assistance of the forces of the so the first reason is that these political part these politicals uh, regardless of the first uh, uh, coup d'etat with Ben Aboud were small political parties and their size was kind of small so they had like uh, ideological orientation so they were either leftist uh, uh, parties or they were Yemeni Islamist parties and uh, uh, they were not able to uh, to execute the political program through uh, the elections uh, because they did not provide they were not they did not have a major authority and so they pr they uh, preferred to have recourse to uh, shortest uh, ways and simplest ways in order to reach the the power uh, because uh, through the the elections uh, the 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 way was uh, rather longer and it required a special kind of assistance and this particular case was not provided uh, during for these organizations especially during these uh, ideological uh, organizations the second reason behind that is that um, there is a this uh, belief uh, amidst uh, these groups uh, of the importance of immediate change, uh, an immediate change that comes from above, and uh, and it's it's a it's a speedy change and it's efficient and and more uh, powerful. Uh, this is a particularly uh, existence in this ideology. This is a part of this ideology, but even in the Arab uh, sphere. Uh, this uh, there is a tendency to believe that the upper the power coming from uh, from above is is quicker and could be very well implemented it, when it comes from above it's uh, it's really uh, very quick and it uh, it's efficient which led 
to uh, the uh, to call for the assistance of these groups. Uh, this uh, orientation uh, was uh, very well clear. So the the soldiers themselves and the uh, officials were had certain uh, urges that uh, propelled these orientations. So when we look at the nature of the uh, military and the and the politicians that uh, seize the power, we see that there are three uh, types, uh, three types of these uh, political military. So first they are they are like officials or they're uh, of the program and uh, these do not uh, uh, do not want to continue. Uh, in, the, in this uh, in this power and the reason was the transition of the power to the civilians uh, and and they prefer to remain in their military positions uh, which uh, impacts clearly uh, on the of course uh, uh, those who seize the power especially after the uh, resurrection in 1985 the second uh, type of uh, of those uh, military soldiers or of officials or politicians are um, those uh, those conservative uh, officials uh, who do not want to provide or to uh, p uh, social or political change but they want to preserve uh, the, the present state of things and to uh, keep things as they are in the country and they endeavor uh, to, uh, of course, create any type of changes in the uh, political and uh, social sphere uh, of Ibrahim Aboud, who did the first uh, coup d'etat in Sudan and was, uh, of course, uh, met with the conservative officials who did not want to create like an essential, uh, you know, uh, change during the six uh, following years. And so the last group uh, are like uh, officials who are rulers and they do have a special political agenda, a special program to create change and immediate change here. Uh, and so we have witnessed that during the May coup d'etat in uh, 1976, um, where uh, by Fair uh, al-Amiri. And of course, uh, during the front, the Islamist uh, uh, front, uh, 1998 uh, by Omar al-Bashir and who, uh, so the, the nature of these officials who uh, endeavor to uh, create changes, uh, so it, it was possible to create a coalition with the political and civilian uh, power. So uh, so to say and to be clear, uh, added to that, uh, of course, the uh, personal uh, ambition of certain officials who uh, want to play their role and or to um, or to or to occupy higher positions in the country. So uh, this is clearly uh, the, the reasons behind and that prompt the civilians to call for the assistance of the military. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Dr. Hassan. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hassan, so thank you. I, I think uh, uh, it will be probably the, the last word you could or something you could say in answer to your question. So and in order to specify clearly uh, the, the, of course, military uh, transition in Sudan, could you please share with us and with those who listen to you uh, the, the, the lessons uh, that we can learn uh, uh, especially during, uh, of course, the, the, this transitional period in Sudan. So, how uh, can we see this democratic, uh, this democratic, uh, of course, uh, like a transition could come from uh, both? So, the first uh, 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 thing that I would like to say: so, it, it's impossible to have like a political stability in Sudan. It is impossible. Uh, and in order to have a sustainability of uh, sustainability of the regime and to have a successful transition, I think it's very good to isolate the uh, political power in the in the country and to uh, and to uh, of course uh, isolate it. Uh, the, the country has suffered uh, from uh, the the. Um, from communism uh, in, in Sudan and uh, the armed forces. And I think it's, uh, of course, it's very important to uh, proceed to its, uh, its uh, role and to play its role. And I think it's very important to have all of the uh, influential political powers in the, or officials in Sudan in the uh, political agenda. And I think that, that supports all of the partners in the uh, political sphere and to uh, provide this assistance, especially in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, this uh, transitional towards democracy and sustainable democracy in the country. Uh, to my, uh, uh, 
the second uh, matter in, the, in my opinion, is that in Sudan, uh, it is very important uh, uh, to have uh, like this, uh, to, to look at this uh, authority or the power, because the power is the one uh, that the, the, the is, is what provides uh, certain uh, necessary elements, uh, education, uh, press, and uh, and of course, and it is the one that controls the programs and the uh, political economic agenda and so on and so forth. So it is very important to isolate, uh, to isolate the authority is to, the power is to isolate, is to be away from everything. And uh, I think it's very important to, uh, to see that this is why we have this uh, uh, this hegemony. And I think in order to, to provide this, uh, uh, we have to work very hard in order to expand uh, the role of society and to have the role of society prominent and to have this prominent role, to have like a role, educational, uh, of course, a role to play for society. And I think it will be the burden will lessen on the on the power. And and uh, to my mind, I think that the actors will and the uh, the activists will play the role and will uh, will propel their agenda forward and uh, would play their role to the best of their ability. Uh, number three. Uh, to my mind is very important as well. It is very crucial for the, uh, the inst military institution should know that a transition towards democracy is in the interest of these uh, military institutions because the military institutions from experience, from a political experience in the uh, military regimes has uh, gone through uh, politicization, politicization uh, especially in the uh, in, in appointments and promotions and it, there was uh, no consideration for uh, competency so when there is a, a democratic power I think transparency will be able to uh, to highlight uh, competencies and will and will and will of course uh, avoid any interventions in the political sphere because it's a considered kind of legitimacy. And uh, in addition to that, uh, the, the relying comp on competencies and skills and is is something very crucial and will allow uh, this to become like a national uh, apparatus that is uh, encouraged by all by Sudanese. Uh, I think it's uh, it's very important uh, to isolate the uh, the any any registration in the uh, political power. I think it will protect the whole society and it will provide uh, an opportunity for everybody to participate and uh, there will be diversity and uh, diversity of the Sudanese government as an institution. It will be encompassing and it will be uh, very uh, protective and it will not be, uh, you know, uh, leaning towards a certain a political party or another. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hassan. Uh, uh, f and for for your uh, insightful uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to say to all those who are listening to us that the article, this article uh, that was provided by Dr. Hassan was, uh, was, uh, is available in the Journal of uh, Arab po Politics uh, before we, uh, we move to the session, to the question and answer session, I would like Ladies and gentlemen, to uh, to present uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Peter uh, Peter Knopf, and and then I would like to introduce uh, Pro Professor Montasir Al Tayyib uh, for uh, to present his uh, comments. Peyton, you, the the floor is yours. Uh, welcome uh, to you, sir. Peyton. All right, can you hear me now? Uh, say it, Peyton. Just to say, uh, 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 for the richness uh, of this discussion and to our two uh, very distinguished panelists for sharing uh, their insights uh, today, uh, both the comparative experience of Tunisia from which we can draw a, a number of lessons. Uh, and then of course, uh, Professor Hassan's uh, very valuable insights uh, on the, the context uh, in Sudan. I think it provides a, an excellent basis for 
uh, further uh, discussion uh, as we go throughout uh, this uh, series, as Dr. Luca uh, laid out uh, at the beginning, uh, and we look towards some of the other uh, segments. So I don't want to take up uh, any more time uh, in order to, to be able to have, uh, uh, have a, a, a good uh, question and answer session, but just to reiterate that uh, uh, on behalf of the U.S. Institute of Peace, how honored we are to uh, be able to provide this platform uh, for discussion at this critical time uh, in Sudan. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peyton. Uh, I would like to start, uh, uh, of course, by presenting a professor uh, uh, or by giving the floor to Professor Montasir al -Tayyib. Thank you. Uh, we will, uh, sorry, uh, we will move now to the question and answer session. There are questions that I see. Uh, we would like to, uh, you know, uh, encourage you to raise your hand if you'd like to ask uh, questions directly to the speakers. And before we launch this, uh, these uh, direct questions, I would like uh, to, uh, to share with you some questions and I uh, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Adnan. There were uh, some uh, questions about the role of military in the transitional periods, uh, especially of institution, military institutions, especially for, to, for military institutions who did not intervene in, the, in, in, uh, in preventing the transitional period. Thank you. Could you please answer this question? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, so I, I understand that it's uh, when you say military, you mean the army, right? I just wanted to double check with you. So this is a, this has a connection with the framework, especially after uh, the the country won, won its independence in 1956. So during that period, and uh, during the 40s, uh, we have seen uh, certain things happening. So we uh, many countries witnessed uh, coup d'etats. Um, uh, uh, and and all those uh, those coup uh, d'état uh, in some uh, cases uh, were consecutive and were uh, uh, in their nature. So they happened uh, simultaneously, and the national uh, movement in uh, Indonesia understood that the uh, fact of intervening the military in the and the, the power or allowing the military or the army uh, would would probably make the army seeking more and more power, and uh, all those who governed the country oh, after the uh, after independence who, uh, were from civilians or uh, who uh, believe uh, firmly in the uh, separation uh, between the authorities. Uh, so the um, Tunisian army in uh, June uh, uh, 56, and the main uh, or political conviction then is to uh, have the military away from any uh, political role. So the uh, military or the army just played the role of development and uh, protecting the borders and uh, staying in uh, its campuses. Um, in the revolution, uh, some transformation happened when the uh, uh, military was asked to help against the uh, demonstrations uh, and protests. And, and of course, uh, their intervention was not um, very violent. So it was seen and perceived as the protective of the a revolution and later on when any uh, disorders happened or some clashes uh, with the minister of interior or the security uh, things uh, used to calm down uh, as the uh, as the security personnel used to withdraw and the uh, military intervened that means it uh, um, enjoys a high credibility uh, due to uh, uh, due to its um, isolation from any political clashes and it never extend its role uh, 
uh, beyond uh, protection, protecting the uh, borders. So there's a, a huge sympathy between uh, the uh, civilians and uh, the military, and it may be one of the uh, main institutions that they uh, trust deeply. Thank you so much, Professor Hassan. We have a question uh, with regards to the some expectation. Is there any expectations of any military intervention in the coming um, time or next? And what are the reasons uh, might um, behind it and how to stop the military intervention? Um, I, I think there is a difficulty uh, 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 if there's an absence of a military co uh, coup. Um, I don't think it's impossible, but I think it is difficult. Uh, the difficulty uh, lies in uh, uh, the uh, multiple variations or varieties that happen in Sudan uh, because the, the revolution that happens in Sudan uh, uh, relies mainly on youth and they will never accept the rule of um, uh, army or military officers. Um, and also the balance of powers as whether we're talking about military or political, I don't think uh, there will be any uh, military coup uh, in uh, the near time or anytime soon. Also, there are other regional factors and international factors that uh, doesn't make it likely to have uh, a strong political coup. However, the military institution will remain as important. And I expect that this uh, uh, political uh, option will be available within the coming few years. It will, again, it will not be uh, in a direct intervention, but maybe it has the uh, veto right and uh, will uh, play some role in uh, the situation in Sudan. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. Uh, there's no doubt that the military institution has an uh, active and efficient role, especially uh, in the uh, Sudan uh, to achieve the um, objectives of the uh, revolution. And I hope that the, the democratic transition will be smooth and uh, to achieve the uh, objectives of the revolution, Sudanese revolution.